Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Writer's Block, a short video series for Fordham University students or writers in general with some general writing tips. And today we're going to be talking about writing prompts, some of the issues that we as students had uh, reading them and trying to understand what a professor is looking for, and then a couple of uh, uh, insights from our own assignments that we've created prompts for. So Peter, what's been your experience with um, in prompts in general? So and I know as an undergraduate myself, I sometimes found prompts daunting and confusing because I would try to pick out like, what was the thing? What was the verb I was being asked to do in each portion of the prompt? And I, I sometimes found that mystifying, right? I, would, I was always the student at the professor's office hours uh, trying to figure that out. Uh, and then as an instructor myself, I totally get it, right? Like, buried in a prompt, there's always a verb that we're asking students to do. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm excited to, to reveal that today so that students don't have the same confusions that I did. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like in undergrad, I always had either prompts that were like two to three sentences and just left the world open to me. So I had no idea what I was supposed to be actually learning or they'd be pages long where you'd just be digging through and trying to figure out what it is that specifically was being looked for. Yep. So uh, why don't we go over some of our prompts and take them as a student might see them and as uh, professors what we're looking for in them. That sounds great. All right. So let me share my screen. All right. So you should be able to see my screen and I our can. viewers should be able to see our screen. So this is a prompt that I use in my composition two class. And it's one of the earlier prompts. Uh, and hopefully this is useful to viewers because if you are at Fordham, you will take comp two and you will probably encounter this prompt or something similar to it. Um, so I can read it out loud or you can read it out loud. Kyle. Why don't I go ahead and read it out loud. I see that it's a three part essay, which is like the standard style of essay for a comp class. So, essay one, and we should always, always read the title of a prompt, an introduction to identification and description. In a three paragraph essay of approximately 500 words, please complete the following assignment. Choose one word that you think best describes you. Obviously, selecting only one word may be insufficient to capture your complexity, but please do so for the sake of this exercise. If you are adamant that you cannot be summed up by one word, Choose the word complicated or a thoughtful synonym. Next, explain how this word is the most appropriate word to describe you. Elaborate and give examples that are not too personal since your paper may be discussed by the whole class. Finally, imagine how this word applies to other people or things as well, and explain what is unique about your particular use of the word. All right, excellent. All right, so as a student, a few things for sure stand out to me. One is I'm going to be doing a lot of pre-thinking, sort of like pre-writing, trying to figure out which word works for me. So that sort of like front ends this assignment. You know, I could pick any number of things. It's, I see that you've given us an out for complicated, which is really useful. So that if I, if I do get stuck at that part, there's an option immediately to go to complicated. And you've built in natural breaks for the paragraphs. So after thoughtful synonym, we have a paragraph break in the prompt. So I know that probably what I'm going to do is paragraph two will be explaining how the word is appropriate. And paragraph three will be finally imagine how the word applies to other people and things. So if I were to write an essay that kind of made those three steps, would I be hitting everything that you're looking for in this prompt? Yeah, so, so long as you, you won, you turn in an essay that is three paragraphs, uh, you, you'd be amazed how many essays uh, are one paragraph, how many essays are two paragraphs, uh, which is why we, we state clearly at the outset three paragraphs. And yet, so long as each paragraph um, syncs up with each part of this prompt, um, that's what we're looking for. And so uh, really what's, what's useful is the choose one word, so this is, this is what you're being asked to do is mm -hmm. choose. Then you're being asked to explain. And then finally, you're being asked to imagine how it applies beyond yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so, so long as you're hitting those three verbs, you are on the right track. Yeah. And I, you know, as a professor, 
<laughs> just getting someone to write in the kind of format that can be kind of um, a challenge in and of itself. And it's, it's one of the things that you kind of look for, especially in an early essay, is whether or not the student is actually picking up on those cues. Yep. Uh, if, it might be useful to review a couple of the pitfalls like I, I see that students making. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to, to think about your word count, right? So it's only 500-ish words. And so that means that each one of your paragraphs is only going to be, you know, 100 and, uh, you know, 150 ish words. And so if your first paragraph is 300 words, you've sort of sunk yourself, right? You, uh, you really want to distribute those words evenly. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing that I see is that I see students doing more than they need to here, right? Again, 500 words is not a ton of space. And so you don't have time to go into the etymology of the word. You don't have space to go into a history of your family's relationship with this word for mm -hmm. generations. Uh, this, this is 500 words. It's, it's a long email, basically. And so you want to get right to the point and really accomplish that verb that uh, you're being asked to do. Yeah, I also see that this is the kind of thing that many students, and maybe even myself, would want to start with a dictionary definition. But that would actually be kind of the exact opposite because what we're looking for is something that describes you, not give me a definition of the word. Yes, and that's, that's a great point, Kyle. If, if I wanted a dictionary definition of the word, somewhere in here it would say define the word that, you're, that you choose, but you're not being asked to do that. That's a great point. All right. So this, um, the final paragraph, imagine how the word, where this word applies to other people or things as well. Explain what is unique about your particular use of the word. This kind of goes into an area where I feel a lot of students would be like, well, you know, th this is natural conclusion territory, but there's nothing that they can really rely on. This is kind of like what I would call like the, the large invention part of the, par of the, of the mm -hmm. essay. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think you're right about that. I think somewhere in our high school careers, myself and perhaps yourself and many of our students, they want to naturally have that conclusion paragraph where they solve everything or they just repeat everything that they had in the first paragraph, which I, I think is, is not so interesting for the writer nor the reader. And so what I always encourage my students to do is to, to make a connection, right? Like seek something out in the world that connects to your argument. And so this is a great example of that. Of So you say your word is clever, right? You would want to think about how does this word uh, exist in the world beyond you? Mm -hmm. All right. I cool. can definitely see that working as, a, as an early essay. It's also a great introduction to students. Yeah, exactly. I, I get a sense. Often I'll assign this essay uh, before I've even met my students, right? Mm -hmm. Or or when I've only met them once. And so this is a great way to get a sense of who's in the room. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort, of a, sort of an icebreaker essay. Uh, and you know, for all, all students out there, right? Essays like this are really, they're not meant to be graded harshly. It's, can you follow instructions? Can you write a sequential essay? And you know, can you introduce yourself to the professor yeah. in a sense? And a lot of students might not necessarily see the point of that in what's ostensibly a writing class, but then, remember that composition or writing course is writing across every different discipline, right? So knowing how to follow instructions when writing a memo or doing legal writing or technical writing, or just kind of understanding the format of an email between you and management, like that's kind of what's being checked here as well, following the form. Yep, exactly. All right, so let's switch on over. I've got an essay from a more English specific course, which is, um, text and context. Now I taught a uh, text and context course on ancient myths and modern retellings and this is our final essay prompt, just one of the options. And uh, would you mind going ahead and reading option A, Peter? Yeah, sure. This is a, this is a great essay. Uh, options A, uh, Gods Without Men. American Gods is mildly controversial within the, the polytheist community for the claim that gods need worship to survive. Gaiman's own view on gods is clear, but does the book really argue this? Con consider the following two quotes. Gods are great, 
said Attila, slowly, as if she were comprehending a great secret. But the heart is greater, for it is from our hearts they come, and to our hearts they shall return, coming to America. Because, Shadow marshaled his thoughts, because I never believed in you, because I didn't know much about Egyptian mythology, because I didn't expect this. What happened to St. Peter in the pearly gates? The long beaked white head shook from side to side gravely. It doesn't matter that you didn't believe in this, said Mr. Ebus. We believed in you. And then I see the assignment here. In a three part essay of 600 to 800 words, consider the relationship between gods and mortals in American gods. Can both these quotes be true? Examine a few more examples of belief and power in the novel. Then use these examples to forward a specific claim about the nature of belief, power, and myth in the novel. Your essay must include at least two direct quotations and a word count. Great, so if I were a student and this landed in front of me, I would, I'd probably read the prompts two or three times. I wouldn't just read it once. I would probably read it highlighter in hand, and I would distinguish between the framing of these two quotes, right? So you, you've already given us information that I'm going to work with in my essay. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that it's mildly controversial, and we know that you are questioning this, that uh, does the book really argue X? And then I'm going to take a look at these two quotes, and then I'm going to see your question down here in the bottom portion. Can both these quotes be true? So that's basically the interrogative that I'm responding to. Mm -hmm. And I, I like how open-ended it is, right? It's a yes or no, but then I'm being asked to explain. And it sounds like how I bolster my argument, so long as I quote from the text, is very much up to me. And I, it, it sounds like I certainly don't just have to quote from these two excerpts, but I can look at the novel as a whole. Absolutely. Um, the whole can these quotes, uh, can both these quotes be true kind of hits at the point of this entire essay, which is just getting someone to figure out where they stand on it. And it's okay to not necessarily have a clear standing on it, just sort of like weigh in their own sort of thoughts. Um, it's not looking for a Neil Gaiman believes this. That's why we have Neil Gaiman's own view on gods is clear. He's already come out on that and said it out loud. But what we're more interested in is what the novel is saying, specifically about these characters. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a great point. So we're, we're able to separate the author from the work of art that they create. Um, and I, if, I actually, I want to amend what I said earlier. I, I drew our attention to the question, can both these quotes be true? But that, that's actually not at the heart of this essay, because that's just a yes or no question. What, what's most important is what comes after that in the prompt, right? Is forward a specific claim, right? Support your yes or no answer. Yeah. And so this is a, this is a, a huge novel, like 600 pages. Um, that is, you know, every chapter has some new kind of take on belief or power. It's concerned with the rise of modern gods of technology and things like that versus older gods. And really all this prompt is doing is providing a framework with a few keywords that a student who's read the novel is going to be able to pick up on and run with it. You're kind of saying like, here's the parameters, but just be free and kind of give me your thoughts on the novel. This is much less, um, so in your prompt, we were very interested in like, can we follow directions here? Yep. Here, the quotes are just to kind of prompt ideas and get us like looking from two different perspectives the human worshiper perspective, and then the God's perspective. And then saying, well, what do you think? And here's a couple ideas, go with it. You know, with an essay like this, you're kind of like established enough of a relationship with the student that you know where, they're, where their interests lie, or you know that they're capable of handling something that's more like five to six pages of just really their own take on the novel. I wouldn't expect, anyone to quote anything except the actual book itself here there's no real outside research yep and that's that's freeing to know for a student right sometimes when a when a prompt lands in front of us we assume that oh, it's a research paper this is going to take forever but your prompt doesn't ask you to do more work than simply examine the novel which can be freeing um 
And un unlike the prompt that I showed, which really asks you to do very specific sequential things, and it's, it's quite a literal prompt, your prompt is way more open-ended. I, I notice in this last paragraph at the bottom, you are asking us to think about belief and power, which are very, those are very broad themes that you can surely access from many scenes within the novel. Absolutely. And we've got belief, power, and myth, but a student could easily leave myth off and just talk about belief and power as it shows up or power and myth and leave off belief. This is a kind of thing where, you know, you might want to actually start pre-writing ideas and talk to your professor. You know, it's going to be a longer paper. There's going to be a bit more work to it. So this is the kind of thing where you might want to just go to office hours or take it to a writing center and get some other person's uh, take on it. I, I always love hearing that we're, we're getting students into the writing center. Always. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully that clears up a little bit more about what uh, we expect as professors and how we experience prompts in general. I think we'll probably do a follow up to this later on where we discuss how to craft prompts uh, specifically for professors and maybe help students get an insight into how we go through that process. Anyway, that's it for now. Take care, everyone.